Now I want to uh, spend some time talking about these quantum numbers and I want to uh, show you how we actually should be thinking about them. Rather than numbers, they actually have like uh, physical meaning. The first one is n and we call this principal quantum number. As you can see, uh, the principal quantum number n determines the energy, which is, let me call this E1 divided by n squared. And if you remember the definition of a bound state, so the bound state does anybody remember how we define bound state? There's like a technical definition. So it was like, if your energies are less than limit of the potential, as the potential goes to infinity, we call these bound states. Otherwise, otherwise we call them scattering states. And we can actually see how this applies to our uh, uh, problem in, uh, in this case, which is the Coulomb potential. So here's the Coulomb potential. So, uh, so this is U of R, this is R, and we are like, at R is equal to infinity, we are at zero, and as R goes to zero, this is going to just blow up with one over R. And we have, for example, E1 here, I don't know, e, we have something like E2 here, maybe, yeah, this is not to scale, but you hopefully got the idea, this is E3, and then as you go to zero, there'll be like infinitely many states, right, but they are all discrete, at E, E infinity, and these are all like bound states, bound states. So what this means is the electron is bound to the Coulomb potential. Since we put the proton in the uh, center of the coordinate system, electron is uh, circling around the uh, uh, coordinate system. We could actually consider the scattering states, st scattering states, exactly like we consider scattering from the potential, but this is rarely done. I, I mean, experts do this, but uh, gen generally we don't teach this kind of stuff, so you can uh, forget about scattering for a while until somebody starts showing it to you. So then principal quantum number is the energy. The second one is L, and this is what we call orbital quantum number. And to understand that, we have to think a little bit more uh, carefully. Let's go back to radial equation. So go back to R equation. Maybe I can, uh, okay, here's my R equation. And I want to copy that and play with this here a little bit. And here is my E, and I want to put Coulomb potential here. So this is going to be, okay, let me open up space. So this is U, and if I put the Coulomb potential, minus minus is going to be plus. This is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, 1 over R. So there is a problem with this uh, uh, equation, and the problem is the following. So when we did the separation of variables, we said each equation should only know about its own variable. Our equation should know about our 
variables, theta equation should know about theta variables, and so on. But here it seems like we have E. So here we have E. And we know energy, this is the total energy. Total energy. And total energy is uh, E is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy. And kinetic energy has, okay, potential energy is simple, right? Potential energy is just uh, Coulomb potential. But kinetic energy has two components. Uh, kinetic energy in radial direction plus kinetic energy in orbital direction. So what this means is like I can decompose the motion in two uh, orthogonal directions. So one, okay, this is my, so here's my coordinate system. And so this is my R. So I can have a motion along R vector, right? right? This is what I call radial equation. And I can have a motion perpendicular to R. This is what I call orbital equation, uh, orbital kinetic energy. But it seems like in my R equation, I have a dependence on orbital kinetic energy. And if we have to, if we like want to separate the equation, this is not acceptable, right? There should be no kinetic energy orbital inside the R equation. So either this one is wrong or we have to find a remedy. And a reasonable thing to uh, look is like, maybe if we just uh, play with these things here a little bit, there'll be some cancellation, then K orbital will drop out. So let's think about that. Uh, this one, let me rewrite this equation a little bit and see what may cancel what. So now I'm going to write what I just told you here. So this is energy is kinetic energy. Let me call O for orbital, uh, or maybe R for radial, plus kinetic energy orbital and there will be also a Coulomb potential, which is going to be minus 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught r. And you can see this plus cancels this, which is nice. And if I can have the similar cancellation for this kinetic energy orbital with this uh, L, L plus 1, I'll be in good shape. So then uh, let's write this. Oh, I think, uh, uh, so you can see this thing is, okay, let me clarify my parentheses. So then, if 2m over h bar squared kinetic energy orb, I think I missed like a minus sign here. Uh, so this one should be minus, this one should be minus. I probably should uh, make uh, the one in top minus two, but uh, not to break the argument, let's not uh, do that. Let's focus on what we are doing here. So orbital should be equal to L, L plus one divided by R squared. So if this is the case, then R equation is separable. And now let's look at this and see if this is actually too much to ask or not. So what is kinetic energy orbital? Kinetic energy orbital is equal to one half m v squared, but along the orbital direction. And what is angular momentum? L is going to be m v orbital times r, right? Like if I am doing like some radial motion, that's not going to contribute to angular momentum. Angular momentum will only be to will only be due to the motion perpendicular to radial direction. 
Then if I plug this in, so this is going to be one half m, and so this is going to give me v orb equal to l over m r. So this is going to be l squared over m squared r squared. This is going to be l squared over 2m r squared. So which is not surprising because like, uh, right, exactly like kinetic energy p squared over 2m for translational motion, I think everybody should be able to write l squared over 2i for rotational motion. Since we have like a point particle in our case, i is m r squared. Right, simple stuff. So this all makes sense. Now, this kinetic energy orbital should be equal to this. So let's write this. So this is equal to this. Why? Because uh, I want separability. Otherwise, I don't know what else to do. So then you can see R's cancel. Oh, I think there's also 2m, right? I need to, like, kinetic energy should be multiplied with 2m over h bar squared. So this is, uh, this is 2m over h bar squared. So this m is going to cancel this. This 2 is going to cancel this. Then l, or if you want the vector l and its magnitude to make it more explicit what we are calculating is going to be equal to h bar L, L plus one. Okay. So what then is, is angular momentum is quantized. So angular momentum is quantized. like this, right? Magnitude is not now L, but it's like some square root. And the relevant quantum number is going to be L. And this is also nice, right? In the uh, Bohr, uh, the derivation of Bohr from the correspondence principle, we also found angular momentum to be in units of h bar. Here we also have that h bar, which is equal to 1.05 4 times 10 to the minus 34 joule times second, which is like a unit of angular momentum. And from uh, the constraint on the equation, the solvability L could be 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. And we designate, okay, since, So these actually come, like these angular momentum numbers correspond to spectral lines, and spectral lines were known prior to quantum mechanics. So they had their names before the quantum mechanics came, and then when the quantum mechanics came, they adopted their names. And for example, we generally don't say L is equal to zero, we call this S, and I think this is for sharp in the spectroscopy. L is equal to one is generally designated with P. I think this is for principal, 2 is D for, I don't remember what, I think diffuse, SPD, F for fundamental, G, H, and so on. And the way we show quantum numbers, with so now we know what N is, we know what L is, we do not say, for example, N is equal to 1, S is equal to 0, Rather than that, we just say 1s. So when somebody gives you 1s, you know these two quantum numbers immediately. So another example, n is equal to 2. For example, l is equal to 1. This is going to be 2p immediately, right? Or if uh, n is equal to 3, l is equal to, uh, I don't know, uh, 2. This is going to be 3d orbital. and so on. Okay, we have one more quantum number, and it is a little bit uh, lengthy discussion, but I think it is the 
most important piece of puzzle. So let's just hang on. I'll just try to be like, there's not much calculation. It's all arguments and arguments and arguments. If you like that kind of stuff. After that, I'll finish it. But it is going to take just a little bit while. Uh, L, so this one? No, no, no. Oh, oh, yes, yes, this is L. Yes, thank you. So this is L. Good job, thank you. That's what I meant. So last piece is magnetic uh, M plus is uh, M magnetic quantum number which looks like the most boring one but I think it is one of the most interesting among N, L and M so first let's think about like a classical uh, electron orbit so classically so there is like some uh, some nucleus uh, proton and the electron is like orbiting around right so this is the classical picture so this is uh, something like that. So this is electron. But we know from classical uh, electricity and magnetism, so electron motion means current, right? If the, the, because charge is moving, there must be a current. And if there is like a current in a loop, that should correspond to what? What what do we use like current loop for? Magnetic. Yeah, exactly, right? There will be a magnetic field, or we can describe that magnetic field so-called magnetic dipole. So this is exactly like your bar magnet, but it's like a tiny version of it from by like a single electron. And my question to you is like, so this mu is magnetic dipole moment. It is supposed to be vector, but let's uh, be a little bit more elementary than that. What is the magnetic dipole moment? Given uh, electron charge, let's, which is going to correspond to current, and there'll be like some area corresponding to or orbit. What is the magnetic dipole moment classically? So this is magnetic dipole moment. So two things, I and A. Does anybody remember? I give you I and I give you the area of the orbit and I ask you what is the moment? What is that? Yes, I, S is area but I use A so let me use A, I times A. So let me, here is my, so this is my mu vector. And now I want to put this mu in a magnetic field. Like, let's think about the magnetic field. So there's like, here's a magnetic field. And so here's my dipole. So this is mu. So this is vector. And my next question is, uh, what is the energy of this thing, right? Or because magnetic field is like magnetic field and magnetic moment is like a bar magnet. If you put two bar magnets, they either repel, right? They want to be either align or anti-align. So there's like an interaction between them because they have each one's field is going to affect the other one. And if I have like the external magnetic field, which is given to be B, and I have mu, how do I write their interaction? Or what is the torque? Maybe I can ask you torque on this magnetic moment by the magnetic field. Minus mu cross B. Minus mu cross B. So this is not advanced, right? We are just like two vectors. What can you do with these two vectors? So for example, let me ask one more. So this is the torque. What is the corresponding potential energy? U. Uh, let me call it U of B. 
like ma due to, like uh, potential energy due to uh, magnetic fields. There's there are only two things, right? There's like mu, there is b, and there are only two things you can do with them. You can take cross product of them, or you can take the dot product, and the, the uh, potential energy is mu dot b. And this one, I want to write it like uh, minus mu b cosine theta. So this theta is this theta. And I'm going to choose this to be our z direction. And that theta is going to correspond to the theta in the Schrodinger equation in a little bit. Now we need to calculate the magnetic dipole moment. OK. Calculate. dipole moment. So we said uh, mu is equal to i times a and i is equal to minus e divided by t and area is equal to pi r squared. And uh, we are working with angular, we now learned angular momentum. Angular momentum is m v r, which is going to be equal to m. And v is uh, 2 pi r divided by t times r. So the interesting quantity is to look at their ratio, like mu divided by l. And this is called, there is also a name which actually tells what it is. This is gyro magnetic ratio. So this is, let's copy this here and divide this entire thing with this. So you can see R square is going to cancel this. T is going to cancel this. Pi is going to cancel that. And this entire thing is going to be minus E over 2M. Then I can generalize this. I can say, OK, now I want to go to quantum world. So this is I know this classical relationship. So quantum mechanically, I'm going to write for mu is equal to, you can see, just take this L to here. And it is going to be, uh, I think I used, OK, let me write what it is, E over 2ml. Because I know L, I just introduce it. I know how it is described quantum mechanically. Then I can go to magnetic moment and describe it quantum mechanically because they are exactly the same thing. Good. Any questions? So this thing, okay, this potential energy is going to be the additional potential energy in the presence of a magnetic field, right? Let me just erase this uh, middleman, and I have this. But for uh, for this, maybe I can first write it like this. Uh, so this is mu dot uh, L, and there is, uh, OK, sorry. I'm trying to write minus mu dot B, but mu is given there. It is going to be E over 2M B dot L. So this will be the additional potential on top of Coulomb. So this is additional potential uh, uh, over u of r above, right? u only dependent on r, this potential seems to depend only on theta, right? And if you open this up, this is going to be e over 2m b l cosine theta. And there's a name for this. So basically, this will be the case when you are learning quantum mechanics. You are going to solve it for like simple problem, for example, free particle, and you are going to add potential, Coulomb potential. And then you solve it for Coulomb potential, and you, let it, you add 
another thing that's more complicated. Like, and in this case, this one has a name and called Zeeman term or Zeeman potential, if you want. So let's try to calculate Zeeman term without calculating anything, right? So first, here is uh, my geometry. Uh, this is so. If you want, this is Z, and the circle is my angular momentum. And so this is z, this is, uh, I don't know, you can uh, rotate this in any direction you want. And cosine theta, okay, for any given point, so this is my theta, cosine theta is going to be magnitude of the momentum along z direction divided by total momentum, right? The radius of this thing is total momentum, which we found to be uh, h bar l l plus 1 just a minute ago. And its projection to z-axis is going to be Lz. And if I take the ratio, it's going to be my theta. So for z, uh, we are going to have this m h bar, right? For this is z angular momentum divided by h bar L L plus 1. So now we have the cosine. And for magnitude of L here, we are going to have h bar l l plus 1 now i can take this term so this u of b so there is b for l i'm going to write this thing um, maybe i can push this just a little bit and for cosine i'm going to write this thing So this thing is going to cancel this, and this h bar is going to cancel this h bar, and at the end we are going to have, so this mu b is for uh, Bohr's name, it's not magnetic field dependent, but uh, that's like a, also like a universal constant. This b is magnetic field, and uh, we have h, uh, I think, uh, I have absorbed h bar there, and I, I absorb th there, so, and this is going to be m. And mu b, let me write what it is. So this is e h bar divided by 2m is Bohr magneton, like x man ma uh, magneton, but uh, it's like uh, its own thing. And its value is uh, 9.27. Because these are fundamental constants, you can just put the numbers in and calculate it to be minus 24 joule per Tesla. You can also convert it to EV if you want. So yeah, so this is the z-axis. And if you want, this is like a sphere. and. Uh, angular momentum can be on any point on the sphere, right? There's like concentric, if you want, you can think about these things. And what is the condition for M and L, right? We said M, uh, I think here, if you remember, we had like a constraint. Here, this constraint, right? M was, or like uh, L was supposed to be bigger than absolute value of m. Why do we have this condition? We have this condition because m is angular momentum projection along z direction. And if you think about uh, m like this, right? And l, huh? Yes, there is like an angular momentum like this, right? This is z component. This is l. Uh, so this is l vector. And if you take its norm, it is going to be h bar um, l l plus 1 and its projection here is h bar m and because of this condition we have like m can be uh, right uh, minus l to plus l there is no way this h bar m can be as big as 
Yeah. So basically, it's the projection. So one is the projection, the other is full angular momentum. And if you look at the cosine, the theta is determined by projection divided by the norm, right? This is the cosine LZ divided by L. And this happened to be m h bar divided by h bar L L plus 1. And I took this and put it in the Zeeman term here. So there are two L Ls in the Zeeman term. One is angular momentum L, right? This happened L L plus 1. And this canceled exactly the, the denominator. And the Zeeman splitting came out to be only M dependent. So this is why it is called magnetic quantum number, because you resolve this quantum number in the presence of magnetic fields. It's like a magnetic uh, identity of the uh, quantum mechanical electron. And what are the values for M? So M can be like um, minus L, minus L plus 1, <coughs> dot, 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 minus 1, 0, 1, dot, 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 L minus 1, L, right? There are in total two L plus 1 different values. For example, if M is equal to 0, the shift due to this Zeeman term is 0. So let me try to recap. So without B, energy was only dependent on this minus E1 over N squared and no dependence on L and no dependence on M. But with B, whenever we turn on magnetic fields, you can see there is like a shift due to magnetic fields. So basically, for example, take a level. They are like, I don't know. Suppose this is L is equal to 1. And they are actually like uh, uh, M can be minus 1, 0, and 1, right? We put these three levels on top of each other. When I turn on magnetic field, these are going to split. Plus one is going to be on top. Zero will be in the middle. And minus one in, will be in the bottom, right? So we are going to split it like this. Uh, this one, this one, and this one. So this is m is equal to minus one. This is m is equal to zero. And this is m is equal to one. And the splitting is given by exactly this Bohr magneton times magnetic field. And this splitting is called either Zeeman effect, Zeeman effect, or Zeeman uh, splitting. So what happens is that without the magnetic field, you have a single line, right? Now we don't care where the spectroscopy comes from. You just have like some data and you just see a single line. And then you ask the person who did the experiment, do exactly the same experiment with the magnetic field. And you are going to see the single line split into three lines. And that is called Zeeman effect. Okay. So without B, all uh, M values are equally likely but because of this condition right this uh, because of this condition uh, l or like if you want uh, m uh, absolute value of m is less than or equal to l right this is the condition for us to be able to solve the differential equation and this side, I just can go and look at LZ, which is h bar m. And this side, I go and look magnitude of L, which is h bar L, L plus 1. Then I see that magnitude of L is always bigger than LZ. Right? And it, not even equality, right? It is always bigger. Why? Because uh, h bar L L plus 1 uh, is bigger than maximum value of h bar. Let me call this m max. But maximum <laughs> value of m max is what? What is the maximum value L m can take? If m goes from minus L to L? L. 
right? So this is equal to h bar times L. This is always an inequality, right? This side, I mean, okay, a little bit ugly, sorry about that, but if I didn't have this plus one here, it would be L squared, take it outside the square root, h bar L is equal to h bar L, but because of this plus one, L, mag magnitude of L is always bigger than LZ. And what this says to us is like, pick any direction, right? Without the magnetic field, any direction is Z direction. Nobody can force me like, oh, this is my Z, right? I don't have to put my Z to the top of the ceiling. I can just put it, I don't know, in some weird direction if I want. So I choose some Z. So I choose some Z. <coughs> and choose some L. So this is LZ. Choose some L. And the angle between these two can never be zero. Because LZ cannot be equal to L, right? And what we are thinking about in the angular momentum case is like angular momentum is going to precess in any direction. Like choose any direction and uh, choose angular momentum, it's going to be precessing. Choose another direction, it's also going to be precessing in that direction. And why do we have that? And uh, okay, a simple argument to understand this, like if L, uh, let me call it L, could be equal to LZ. That means what? So let's think about now real space. So this is X, Y, and Z. And my electron is doing some kind of orbit. And its angular momentum is exactly in Z direction. There is no component in LY and there is no component in uh, LX. So this is my L. Then what is the orbit? Which, on which plane is the orbit going to be? Right? If I give you this, right? Exactly, right? Right hand rule. An electron is going to be in the XY plane, like this. But if electron is exactly in the XY plane, that means delta Z is equal to zero. Right? But because I, I, for, only, for, for me to be able to do that, delta Z can only be zero. But if this is the case, then delta Z, delta PZ, H bar over two is violated, is violated. Then this cannot happen. So choose any direction you want, angular momentum cannot align on that. So, and this is, if you want, is an inherent property of quantum mechanics, you cannot get away with. So we say that L precess around Z axis. So if you look at the averages, for example, average LX can be equal to average LY equal to zero, and average LZ is going to be M times H bar, but not their like instantaneous uh, values. Right? Their averages can, like, for example, if I'm doing this kind of motion, LX and LY, they are taking all positive and negative values, and they can average to zero. And, uh, but that doesn't mean uh, my L is along LZ. So suppose, like, the, so this simple calculation is showing us that angular momentum cannot be along Z direction. And the question is, why is this supposed to happen? Suppose my angular momentum is exactly along Z direction. If my angular momentum is in the z direction, by right-hand rule, the electron orbit has to be in xy plane. And if electron is on exactly on xy plane, that means z position of electron is z is equal to zero, exactly. And that means the uh, uncertainty in z is zero, right? You are just putting exactly on z. There is no variation along z. Then that means delta z is zero. If delta Z is equal to zero, you automatically violate this delta Z, delta PZ, bigger than H bar over two. Then you go back and say that this, this can never happen. Angular momentum can never point in a given direction. Whatever direction you choose, it's going to always precess in that direction. So this is a little bit complicated, but uh, if you sit down and think about it, I think it is very simple to understand. But if this is the first time you see it, uh, you have to think about it just a little bit. Any questions?
Any comments? If not, maybe I can stop here and see you on Wednesday.